Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started in just a couple minutes. Let uh, the stragglers file in. I'll give my introduction at that time. Good afternoon, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the fourth member hour in our producer series entitled Producing Cotton in North Carolina. My name is Sarah Rodriguez. I'm in the membership department at ASABE, and I'll be the host for this session today. ASABE member hours were started as an opportunity for members to learn, connect, and grow. In a few minutes, we'll get things rolling, but just a few quick ground rules. Please do keep your audio on mute. If you have any questions, you can type them into the chat uh, throughout the presentation, and we'll also be opening up at the end for verbal questions if you'd like to speak your question aloud. Um, this meeting will be recorded, and we archive all of the footage on our YouTube channel so that you can share it afterwards, or you can go back and, and watch it again if you'd like. Um, today, we're hearing from Ed Barnes. Ed is the Senior Director of Agricultural and Environmental Research at Cotton Incorporated. Ed manages agricultural engineering related projects, including ginning, precision farming, irrigation, and conservation tillage system research. Please join me in welcoming Ed Barnes. Hey, Sarah. Thanks a lot for having me. I uh, really appreciate this opportunity to share with you about cotton. I'm going to go ahead and pull up my slides. Everybody seeing that now? Welcome. <laughs> All right. So um, I am going to take a little twist on the title and refer to uh, this presentation as cotton from dirt to shirt. Uh, I am going to highlight, uh, use North Carolina as an example when we're talking about how we produce cotton or how we grow cotton. Uh, but then I would like to take you through a little bit of the ginning and, tech and uh, textile processing. So, uh, Get my, there we go. So I want to give a little introduction to who Cotton Incorporated is. That's who I work for. Uh, some really basic information of on cotton, uh, what it's used for and, and different species. And then we'll go through the agricultural production process, which for some of you that maybe don't work in cotton, but work in corn and soybeans or some other row crop, will find uh, familiar to you. And then if you don't work in cotton, I am going to spend some time talking about the cotton ginning process. I've already seen that we've got a couple of our ginning experts on uh, this call. And so if I get something wrong, they can they can call me out. And then very short amount of time, I want to just take you all the way through the shirt process and uh, just show a few of the steps that, that in textile manufacturing. And then finally, I just want to talk real briefly, one or two slides on our cotton industry sustainability goals. And throughout this presentation, I'm gonna kind of highlight where I see some opportunities for agricultural engineering to help our, our cotton farmers and our cotton industry. So just uh, a quick recap of who I am, who's gonna be barraging you with information for the next 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, I am a native of North Carolina. I grew up near Asheville in the Western part of the state. My first agricultural experience was working on Christmas tree farm. And so uh, I did not have the glamorous jobs. I was the one with the push mower uh, mowing around the, 
the Christmas trees and uh, harvesting briars and digging ditches. Um, I got into biological and agricultural engineering because I, I like biology and math. And, you know, when you can apply that to agriculture or something really useful and feeding the world, that seemed like a perfect fit. I don't regret that decision. Uh, had some great schooling at NC State in biological and agricultural engineering, my master's and, and bachelor's, and then Oklahoma State for my PhD. Also worked there two years as an extension engineer, <clears throat> assisting six uh, full-time extension engineers, and that was a real learning experience. Uh, finally, spent seven years working for USDA ARS, and what was at the time the U.S. Water Conservation Lab has since been integrated and is now part of the Arid Lands Research Center in Maricopa, Arizona. And then finally, for the last 20 years, I've been working at Cotton Incorporated. So over that time period, I have uh, learned a few things about cotton that I want to share with you now. Our Cotton Incorporated is uh, incorporated's misleading. We are not a for-profit company. We're actually a not-for-profit company. And incorporated refers to the fact that cotton incorporates all things cotton from basically dirt to shirt to the consumer. So uh, the, the company's mission is pretty straightforward to increase the demand for and profitability, profitability of cotton through research and promotion. So we don't do lobbying. There's a National Cotton Council National cotton generators that get into farm policy. We are a research and promotion organization only. And so we're what's called a checkoff program. Uh, you know, uh, got milk. We had our milk presentation previously. That is from the milk checkoff or, you know, pork's the other white meat. And cotton is the fabric of your lives. That is our tagline. We are uh, headquartered. Our world headquarters is in, here in Cary, North Carolina. That's the front of our building. And it's a little bit, I always, when people visit, I say we're a little bit like if you're a Doctor Who fan, the TARDIS, in that it, the building appears bigger on the inside than outside because what you can't see pictured there is our um, 90,000 square foot textile pilot plant that's in the back of the building. Uh, we're located in North Carolina because uh, when this, when back in the uh, 80s and 90s, this was the heart of the textile development. And we were largely a domestic industry at that time. And so uh, the company was located in North Carolina to easily service our, our domestic customers. Obviously that has changed. And I'll show you later that we now primarily export cotton out of the United States. And so we have, in addition to this office, we have a New York office that focuses on consumer promotion. We have an office in Hong Kong in Shanghai, China to support Asian textile mills, as well as a, a smaller office in Osaka, Japan. And then for South America, we have an office in Mexico City. Again, really focused on helping people with the textile industry. So our company is kind of divided into these divisions that correspond to the really the cotton supply chain. So I always get to say I'm the dirt part, the agricultural and environmental research. I'll say more about that in the next slide. We have a re relatively new, in the last five years, we've added a division to just address sustainability issues. And they don't just work in agriculture, they work across, again, with textiles, improving, really improving the sustainability across our whole supply chain. Fiber competition, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about fiber quality, uh, the, and they provide services to textile mills as well as trying to help us improve the quality of cotton fiber. Uh, the product development implementation, they're the ones that are actually designing fabrics and yarns and clothes. And then we have a marketing team that promotes that to uh, companies like Target or Ralph Lauren or Walmart. And then finally, uh, consumer marketing that does do everything from TV ads to YouTube promotions and, and things like that. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is we are funded uh, through an assessment of all U.S. cotton, upland cotton producers, and I'll talk about what's the difference between upland and other cottons in a second. Uh, they pay a dollar per bale plus a half a percent of the value of that bale, and the bale is 500 pounds of fiber. We'll show that later too. And additionally, we also get funded by companies that import uh, cotton textile goods, and that, that, again, is back to the Targets and Walmarts and Polos and all those groups. Um, 
because they benefit from our promotion services. And we also do training for their people on, on how to purchase uh, textile and specify textile goods. So that's where our, our funding comes from. On the ag research side, I'm one of a member of the team that you see here. We have entomologists, as you can see, weed scientists, pathologists, entomologists, cotton breeding, and then uh, cotton seed promotion. I'll say more about that. So this is what we do is we uh, fund projects, mainly with land grant universities and uh, USDA ARS laboratories uh, and some private companies, but across the Southern US, what you see, I'll show a better picture there of, uh, of, of the cotton belt, but that gives you a, a broad idea of the areas that we work in. And so I'm responsible again for our agricultural engineering projects, anything from irrigation to ginning to harvest to some of the precision technologies. So if we kind of transition to our Cotton 101, uh, cotton is about 50% of the fiber used in apparel and home, te home textiles. We had that up to 65%. Uh, and then cotton hit two dollars back in two thousand eight, and that we we that kind of did some demand destruction. Um, those prices in cotton now have stabilized. It's actually a little lower than we'd like right now, about eighty five cents a pound for the fiber. Uh, you know, and but so that that makes us more competitive. What we're competing against is not cotton from other parts of the world. Really, what we're competing against is polyester, is our that synthetic fiber that's our main competition for ours. You know, what cotton fibers are used for, as you might expect, clothing is our biggest use. And then home textiles, which includes, you know, sheets and towels and things like that. And then that 3% other, I'm not going to say much about today, but that includes non-wovens like wipes and uh, insulation and cars and things like that. Uh, we're trying to expand our presence in that market, but it is a very cost sensitive market. And so... Uh, in some ways, we don't want to be cheap enough to compete in that market because that would not be good for our farmers. Here is where I think plant taxonomy actually paid off. I, I became an engineer. One of the reasons is I hate memorizing things, and I definitely uh, am not good at pronouncing uh, Latin phrases. Um, but in this case, these are the, you know, the species of cotton that are domesticated. There's many more species, I think 30 or 40 other species of cotton, but the ones, and it's really these top two that are the main species that are used uh, for, for apparel and home textiles. And the first one is upland cotton, and that represents about 90% of the cotton grown in the world. And the, the technical species name is Cassipium hirsutum. And I'll tell you why that's important. It's because of the other cotton, that's the other really that other ten percent. Those last two, I won't say much about because um, the the, uh, the they're very limited, like less than one percent. Uh, but uh, the Gisipian barbadense in, in the U.S. we call it Pima is actually a, you know a different species, and it is longer, stronger, finer. It's a it's a a premium fiber. It's actually right now, uh, amazingly selling for over $2 a pound. I think it almost hit $3 a pound um, because there is a limited supply of that right now and it is a higher quality. And the reason I bring up the importance of the Latin name is you've probably heard of Egyptian cotton. Well, what is that? Technically, according to the Federal Trade Commission, that is cotton that was grown in Egypt. So it says nothing about what species of cotton it is or what quality it is. It just means it came from Egypt. And in reality, in Egypt, they grow both upland and pimas. And so uh, just because it's Egyptian cotton doesn't necessarily it's, means it's better. If it's Gisipian barbadense, then you have a superior fiber. And I will also mention that um, they have, I said we are funded by upland cotton producers. If someone's growing pima, their checkoff dollar goes to a company called Supima that's uh, based out in Arizona. And so they have their own promotion program uh, separate from upland cotton producers. And if you do see Supima, I will give them a shout out. That is, uh, they are very good about protecting their brand image and that is very likely to be Gisipian Barbadense if it has Supima on the label. Cotton is grown all around the world. 
here you can see the, the, uh, the major cotton producers, India and China, uh, kind of compete for who's the biggest producer. And uh, one of the things, a lot of these statistics I'm going to show you are on five-year averages. And all of you that work with uh, production agriculture know things can vary so much from one year to the next. So I really feel like when we're presenting statistics on any kind of agricultural system, that we look at five-year averages to really uh, get a true understanding of what's the status of the system. Uh, so India and China almost represent 50% of the world's cotton. United States is the next. Uh, Brazil has been starting to grow a lot more cotton. Then of course you can see the, the remaining countries there. So if we look where is cotton produced within the, in the United States, this is the, again, a little more refined map of the US cotton belt. And these are the number of bales produced per county in as the, the color code. And so you can see while we do grow cotton in Kansas and Missouri and Virginia, it is very much in the Southern part of those states. Uh, as you get too far North, cotton likes it hot and needs a certain amount of heat units to reach maturity. And so uh, I'll, and I will say, you know, there is probably this evidence of global warming in that when I started about 20 years ago, cotton was very new to Kansas. And I, in my naivete, I said, well, that won't last very long. And well, 20 years later, it's still growing there. So I think we are gonna see cotton be able to, to move North as our climate warms. And then talking about North Carolina, I'm going to show you a picture. I just want to point out there's this one uh, little uh, county here, Stanley County, Charlotte's over here. So this is one little, this is a very consistent cotton producing county though. Um, and I'll, I'll say more about them later. I just wanted to point that out on the map, but you can see this is I-95 is running right through here. And so most of our cotton in, in North Carolina is grown to the east of I-95. Uh, and it kind of concentrates right on the Virginia border, and then there's another concentration on the South Carolina border. And then here are your pictures of this is a, essentially one of these. This is three 500-pound bales of cotton that are together on a clamp trunk, just because <laughs> bales are the, are the unit of measure that we use in the cotton industry. So I just wanted to illustrate that. If we look at that same data, uh, Aggregated by state, you can see that in the U.S., Texas by far the largest cotton producing state. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about water later. But one of the reasons Texas is so faithful to cotton is uh, a lot of that cotton is in West Texas where they have limited rainfall. And uh, despite uh, some of the Internet rumors, cotton is actually a very heat and drought tolerant crop. And so it's one of the few crops that they can grow profitably with the amount of rainfall they have there. There is some irrigation and cotton will love that and perform very well. But if they don't have irrigation, cotton is a good option. And then you can see Georgia is pretty much a clear number two. And then all these other states, depending on the, the five-year average you use fight for, uh, for position three and four, there have been times, North Carolina is kind of down here right now, but there have been times when North Carolina has been the third or fourth most uh, cotton producing state. And then, like I said, on, our, on this five year time period, we averaged about 18 million bales of cotton in the US each year. And 85% of that was exported. So mainly uh, to Asia. And then uh, that, that cotton has turned into a t-shirt or a polo or a you know, khaki pant and gets exported back uh, to the United States. Interestingly, when we did a, a life cycle assessment of some cotton products, um, that slow boat to China has very low carbon emissions, so the transport was not uh, as big a deal as you might expect. And then globally, we produce about 116 million bales, and that's pretty close to what is consumed. Another good story for cotton, and this is on a global basis, um, we have been increasing cotton yields consistently since the 1960s, which has allowed us to meet the increase in demand without increasing land use. So this green line is a trend in yield kilograms of fiber produced per hectare. We also produce cotton seed, which is important. That's not included in this measure right now. Uh, 
And then you can see this is a global. So we've been staying right, you know, around 33,000, uh, I'm sorry, 33 million hectares uh, pretty consistently for, for a number of years. So that's a good part of our sustainability story. If we start looking at how do we grow cotton in the Northern hemisphere, uh, cotton is also grown in, in Australia and Brazil. So, in, but for the Northern hemisphere where most of the cotton is grown, you're gonna plant in the spring. I'm gonna go specifically into times that we planted in North Carolina in, in 2021, but you can see the planting window there, but a lot of it is in April, May timeframe. Then the cotton develops and then starting in mid-September to October to early November, is when most of the harvest occurs. And if we kind of look at what happens during that process, of course, we start with planting. And so in, in, uh, in 2021, about 41% of the uh, US, uh, I'm sorry, of North Carolina cotton acres were planted by May 15th. And in this picture, there's a, there's a couple things going on. One, we're really encouraging uh, growers, especially in, in areas with adequate rainfall, to, to adopt uh, cover crops to improve soil health, increase you know, carbon capture, increase water holding capacity, prevent erosion. And, uh, and this is a, a field in that I showed you Stanley County, which is a non, like I said, kind of non-traditional to the rest of our cotton growing area and that there are hills there and there's some topography. And so uh, it's the farmers there uh, were some of the first to adopt cover crops many, I think about 30 years ago. Uh, I talked to my farmers there and they tell me, I got six inches of soil and if it, any of it washes away, I'm, you know, I'm in trouble. So they have always been very diligent in uh, practicing cover crops. Most of the time you'll see cotton growing, it will be, it's in areas that just happen to, you know, have a lot less topography, especially West Texas and the Mississippi Delta. But even in Eastern North Carolina, it's a lot flatter. So once we plant about five to seven days later, uh, the plants emerge, you can see a cotyledon uh, coming out of the ground. Here, I'm not showing a cover crop so you can kind of see the plants better. Um, and we had an agronomist that said uh, cotton likes to come out of the ground and try to die. And so if you've ever grown cotton, when I grew cotton, it was always a little bit unnerving because you can see these first 20 to 30 days, there's not much going on above ground. And what's happening is there's a lot of root development that's occurring below ground. And so uh, it, is, it is a bit unnerving to watch the plant sit there and say, are you ever going to do anything? And so it takes it about a good 20 days to really start taking off. And in this case, we were have uh, in 2021 in, in North Carolina, we had our crop emerging by, by May 22nd. And because cotton is a little slow to take off, and this is, you know, maybe not that different than corn and soybeans, herbicide uh, are, is a key way for weed control early season. And this is something I really want to make sure all of you engineers are aware of the challenges of herbicide resistance. Here you can see um, the modes of action, new modes of action that have been discovered. And you can notice in the, um, in the 80s, they ceased to discover new modes of action. This red line is the number of herbicide uh, resistant weeds. And so this has continued. This projection, unfortunately, is proving to be on track. And so there are concerns. We are going to hit a point where uh, there will be some weed species that cannot be controlled with a herbicide. And most of our, uh, you know, majority of our commodities rely on herbicides for weed control. And that could really be devastating for us. I want you to look at this. If you haven't seen this paper before as an engineer and you work anything on tillage or robotics, I encourage you to look at this paper, Weed Management in 2050. Uh, one of the things I do talk about is uh, ro you know automation as a way to control these herbicide resistant weeds. So I just want to make sure there's some good engineers. There are some right now, but that uh, we have several engineers that are giving thought to this this challenge that faces our agricultural system. And here's just an example. I noticed the headquarters sent out a link uh, last week by uh, to the to an article talking about carbon robotics. This is an autonomous platform and this, this is their demo unit. And you can see this is actually lasers uh, that are hitting the weed, burns the weed, 
I'm sorry, that's where my camera was kind of in sync with the lighting system. That's not the laser. You you can't see the laser until the weed catches on fire. Um, and so that is one exciting, uh, you know, option for controlling herbicide resistant weeds. Unfortunately, right now, this thing, you know, can't go above a mile per hour. Uh, but anyway, it is an exciting technology. Glenn Rains is an agricultural engineer at University of Georgia who's working on, this is using CO2 lasers. He's wor working on more low power lasers to see if we can make a more affordable uh, system. So that's something good. I mean, if you're an engineer and you don't get excited about a laser shooting robot, I just question your, you know, how much of an engineer are you really? <laughs> um, so once we move past uh, that, we get into squaring, which is kind of a funny term that, uh, I don't, I, no one's really given me a good explanation for why we call it a square. It's a flower bud and it does not look square. If anything, it looks like a triangle or a pyramid as you can see pictured here. But uh, so uh, in 2021, by July 11th, most of the 50% of the crop had squares on it. And, and this just kind of shows the size of a crop when those squares are forming or those flower blooms and then our uh, flower buds. Um, and it's also a time where uh, we need to worry about water management. Like I said, cotton kind of gets a bad rap on its water reputation. In reality, in the United States, um, only about 40% uh, of our cotton acres are even set up to receive irrigation. And, and But where we do use irrigation, a lot of you have helped us or help our farmers have a lot of tools to manage that irrigation very precisely, deliver it appropriately. Um, this is kind of our overall water strategy uh, and the the plant water productivity you see here. This is high throughput phenotyping. Ken Stone worked with Todd Campbell. Uh, this is at a research station in North Carolina, but they're out of the USDA ARS in Clemson. I mean, sorry, in Florence. And uh, they put together this phenotyping tractor to look for, uh, to identify uh, varieties of cotton that have higher drought resistance that's planted in a very sandy field. And then water capture is something, again, it's beyond a cotton issue. I think it's a really sus key sustainability issue for all of uh, U.S. agriculture, especially uh, agricultural systems in, in west of the, I'm sorry, east of the Mississippi, where we have, uh, you know, more human environment. But even with cover crops, there are going to be rainfall events where there's runoff that runs off the field. And, you know, according to a lot of climate models, those are going to become more frequent and common. And so I think we're going to need to increase the use of farm ponds and water capture on farm. Um, if we get into these situations where we, maybe the quantity or, you know, the total amount of, of water doesn't change, but the frequency uh, of those rainfall events does. And so we need to do a better job of capturing that rainfall. So um, just some examples, Michelle Reba is an agricultural, I think she's actually a civil engineer, but a, or she is a member of ASABE and working at uh, Jonesboro, Arkansas and looking at uh, recharge basins for recharging aquifers. And then um, at NC State, Dr. Yusuf is uh, working with us to quantify the benefits of farm ponds beyond just water quantity, looking at the impacts on water quality. And even this is intriguing, that if we could strategically locate farm ponds, maybe that would even help with flood control. So uh, that's another area ag engineers are, are helping us out with. Uh, if you want to know more about cotton irrigation, um, this was one of my COVID projects, but really all the co-authors here carried a lot of the burden of, of kind of capturing where we've been in applying technologies for better water management and water resource issues in cotton. Um, and then if you're curious about some of the tools that we offer to our cotton farmers, uh, that bottom link is to our grower facing website where you can just look up cotton cultivated, uh, Google cotton cultivated, and that should take you there uh, where we're making some tools like a um, irrigation scheduling app developed by George Felitas and others at University of Georgia, uh, where a farmer can just, you know, uh, take the app into the field, click on their field, a planting date and soil type, and it will then pull in either local weather stations or from the national weather grid uh, and help them understand how much water their, their crop is using and, and better schedule irrigations. So once we get past squaring, 
we end up at the cotton blooms and cotton has beautiful flowers. And it's interesting, the, the first day the flower opens, it's white. And then once it becomes uh, fertilized and the pollen's taken in, it, it will eventually turn pink. And then after it turns pink, it falls off the plant. So that's where the yellow, the pretty white flowers and pink flowers come from. Also make a note that uh, Pima cotton actually has yellow flowers. So that species uplands have white flowers and then Pima also has a very pretty yellow flower. We get into bowl development and bowl is what we call the fruit of the plant. So cotton is a fruit, the seeds are on the inside. You can see once that flower is fertilized, that pink flower falls off. And then this bowl over about 30 days goes from small. And then once it gets this big, what's going on is the fiber inside that bowl and the seed inside that bowl are maturing. So again, cotton, we have all our own nomenclature and it's not fruit, it's a bowl. And when we think about cotton bowls, you can't uh, skip over boll weevil eradication. The, if you're not familiar with the boll weevil, it was an invasive pest that really almost decimated the U.S. or did decimate the U.S. cotton industry. It came in uh, from Mexico back in starting the late 1800s. It's worked its way all the way across the U.S. and eventually into Virginia. And uh, one of the really great accomplishments of the cotton industry working together was to eradicate the boll weevil. What you see in the foreground here, and we still use these, this is a boll weevil trap. It has a pheromone that, that attracts any boll weevils nearby, and then they can scout these traps. And we haven't seen a boll weevil in North Carolina for I think uh, almost more, more than 20 years. There's still a little bit of active ro ro eradication occurring in very South Texas, right on the Mexican border. But essentially we have eradicated the boll weevil from the United States before, uh, again, it, it almost made cotton a non-viable option. And, and now we saw when the boll weevil was eradicated, a lot of gins in North Carolina were built in the 1980s because cotton became an economically viable crop again. And so that, but it was really a, an impressive system. Marshall Grant was the kind of leader here in North Carolina that helped get that program started. And you can imagine there was a lot of skepticism that you could eradicate a pest, but uh, eventually it was accomplished. So that was a, uh, a real exciting thing for cotton. Finally, we get that bowl to open and you can see it's a nice fluffy bowl. Uh, in, in this example for North Carolina in 2021, by uh, October 10th, 84% of the bowls were open. And we just started harvest, so about 11% of the crop was harvested, which is a, I'd say 2021 was not, it was a typical year. And so often uh, October is a very active time for harvest in North Carolina. It's in the Mid-South, Mississippi Delta, often that will be in September, and it goes into November in Texas. And this is where, it, again, engineering plays an important part for the cotton industry. Um, here you see a module builder in the foreground. That was actually a joint project between Cotton Incorporated in the 1970s and Lambert Wilkes at uh, Texas A&M. And it used to be all cotton was put into a wagon. And when your wagons filled up, you had to, to wait for the gin to give your wagons back. So this big trash compactor makes a 32 foot by eight foot by eight foot uh, rectangle that can sit on the edge of the field covered with a tarp. Here you can see the harvester. I'll show a better picture of the harvester later going into a bowl buggy, which uh, for some of you more familiar term would be a grain wagon. And that way the harvester can stay in the field as much as possible and not spend time uh, traveling to the edge of field. So that was uh, really helped in getting rid of the wagons. And again, you know, it's, it's always, sometimes I feel like you know, look at what we're working on and it seems like we're not going anywhere. But if you step back and look at where we've come from, um, you know, as engineers, we have a lot to be proud of. Here on this blue line is hours of labor to make that 500 pound bell. So in 1945, it was around 130 to 140 hours of labor to make a bell of cotton. Um, obviously, back then there was a lot of hand harvest. And believe it or not, most of cotton, for example, in India is still uh, uh, harvested by hand. Um, and then we see this green line is the percent that was machine harvested. 
So by the early 70s, we were all machine harvested, and obviously that greatly reduced labor. And then you see this continue, labor continuing to go down, and part of that was due to the module builder. And that also had an impact on our cotton ginning industry. Uh, here is the number of bales processed per gin, and then here is the number of gins. Since you can see we went from um, almost 4,500 gins in the 1970s down, now we're down to just over 500. And a lot of that, um, the blame or credit goes to the module builder because again, we decoupled the harvest and ginning process. So um, the, the gin, the farmer could wait long, you know, didn't need to be as dependent on the gin. One of the things uh, in cotton that's kind of interesting, we do have a stripper versus a picker. Harvester, this, on the, this one is a stripper, and you can see the plant goes between. This is a brush and a bat, and it, it really does take a lot of the material off the plant and, and leaves the stock behind, but it takes in a lot of material. It actually has a cleaner on board to help clean out some of that material versus a picker. Um, you can and you can tell them from a distance because the stripper doesn't have the it has a, a conveyor that conveys all the cotton to the middle of the machine and then it's put into the basket. Whereas a picker, every bro unit has its own air duct that then is blown into the basket. And here you can see the spindles. These are like drill bits that are spinning that selectively pull the cotton off the plant, and uh, so it takes a lot less foreign material with it. Yeah, the stripper is more popular in areas like West Texas, where again, under dry land conditions, you may end up with very small plants that would be difficult for the picker to uh, get, get low enough to, to harvest. And so the stripper is often the predominant harvest system in West Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, whereas the picker is predominant in the rest of the U.S. And uh, when I showed that... Uh, module builder before that one of the things about that you know to harvest cotton you needed four to five people you needed someone to drive the harvester you needed someone to drive the bowl buggy and there always seemed to be two or three people needed to keep the module builder operating and to put the tarps on um, in 2008 john deere released this new harvester and basically it created a cylindrical module here you can think of it as a as a round bell but this is eight about eight feet in diameter and weighs anywhere from 5,000 to 6,000 pounds. So much more than a, a circular hay bale. Um, and it can, it has a little of accumulator so that it can eject a module and still be picking cotton. And then it can carry that module to the edge of field and, and drop it uh, while the machine's turning. So uh, this did two things. It greatly reduced uh, labor requirements and so now you're essentially to just one maybe one person definitely in the field and then someone else has to come back and arrange the modules for pickup but still uh, greatly reduce labor another thing that's interesting every one of these modules has a RFID a, a tag on it so that we can trace back to what part of the field that module came from and I'll talk about the importance of that in a second uh, and, and so, um, because we have that RFID tag, uh, John Monier is an agricultural engineer at the USDA Agricultural Research Service Lab as a ginning lab in Lubbock, Texas, has helped uh, demonstrate how the RFID tags basically can be used to trace that module from the field throughout the ginning process. And um, if the 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 uh, producer is using John Deere has a uh, harvest ID system that that uh, data can be entered once and then just follow that module all the way through the bell that comes out of the gin. So uh, I'll talk more about how we're making uh, new uses of that data. And really, you know, labor savings is a huge issue. Our farmers, that's a top concern. You know, I think even after COVID, uh, a lot of people are having labor issues, but before COVID in our rural areas, finding dependable and skilled labor has been a challenge. And so when you kind of look on this left side of this diagram is a lot of the research that's been done uh, using artificial intelligence, phenotyping, sensor-based management. Um, 
All these things have been proven out on the grower side. We're seeing herbicide failures, labor shortages, and we've had demonstration that uh, auto steer certainly works and is becoming, you know, I would say um, about 80% of our cotton farmers are using auto steer. So this is all leading to automated farming, which has been evidenced by, you know, last two years, John Deere's announcement of their autonomous tractor, uh, CNH followed quickly. Uh, they have a autonomous spreader. Uh, so there's just autonomy is coming to the farm and we need it. And so I want to encourage that. And uh, just, uh, I was really excited that ASABE decided to have cotton uh, harvest as the robotics competition in 2022. And I think they're going to, we did have some challenges. And so that's going to be repeated, hopefully, I think is the plan in 2023. So that was Really exciting to see the students come up with some unique ideas on how to harvest cotton. And one of the things in our mechanical system, uh, cotton is uh, matures from the bottom to the top. So that bowl can be sitting, that first bowl that opens may be sitting out there for 50 days. And so if we could find a way to uh, automatically go through the field several times a year, that would reduce risk of harvest loss due to extreme weather events and also improve the quality of the cotton. So. We are looking some, and here's just an example of Hussein uh, is a graduate student, or I think actually just, uh, I believe is becoming a professor at Mississippi State University working with Alex Thomason. And this is a, a prototype of a, a system to remove cotton out of the bowl. This is, he's farther along than this. I just thought this video was very clear that you could see the end effector working. So we're excited about maybe where possibilities for autonomous cotton harvest in the future. Now let's quickly um, go through the ginning process. And, and the core of this process is really not that different than what Eli Whitney came up with all those years ago. Uh, but this is a diagram provided by Lummis uh, Technology, which I appreciate. So the cotton enters this end of the gin, what's called the module feeder. It goes through a drying step. Uh, and this is all what we call seed cotton. Again, another cotton term. That means cotton before the fiber and seed have been separated. So at this point, it's still, uh, and, the, and the seed, the, the fiber grows off the coat of the seed, so off the surface of the seed. Um, then it goes through seed cotton cleaning. That's where, you know, uh, in, especially in stripper harvest, there's a lot of extraneous matter that gets harvested. That gets removed in this process. And then finally, at the middle of all this equipment is the, the gin stand, which is where the seed and fiber are, are separated and where ginning actually occurs. The seed kind of goes out the bottom of the gin stand and then the fiber continues on. And then we have some lint cleaning and then finally it's pressed into a bale. And so here I wanna thank uh, Derek Whitelock and uh, the Mississippi and New Mexico gin labs. This is a, a picture, high-speed video of uh, some cotton, the cotton's, this is seed cotton flowing in. It goes across what we, a saw, it's not really cutting it, it's conveying the cotton. A grid bar then removes some of, you see this extraneous matter flows off and then the good cotton gets pulled back into the processing stream. And then that stage is repeated because sometimes some of the good cotton makes it over the grid bar. So this second one will then clean it further and again, eject foreign matter and then go back into the processing stream. So that's seed cotton cleaning. Here's the actual gin stand. Um, and it is, the, again, this is seed cotton flowing in. It's getting pulled in and these are ribs. And this is called the saw that's rotating. Again, the saw is not cutting the fiber. It's pulling the fiber between the ribs and then the seed can't fit. And so once all the fiber, the, and the fiber kind of entangles itself in the seed roll, and so it can't get free until all the fiber has been removed. And once the fiber is removed, you can see the seeds that are falling uh, from the gin stem. And then finally, just an example of, uh, this is zoomed in on a single grid bar of a lint cleaner. Here the fiber is being thrown against that grid bar, and then uh, any of the like leaf trash and things gets thrown away. Sometimes, and this is something that the, our New Mexico Gin Lab spent a lot of time working on, sometimes uh, some seed coats and things get pulled back in and that's not what we want. And so that was one of the things they were studying there. 
there, there's some material being ejected the way it's supposed to. So that's the lint cleaner. Um, I did want to mention, like I said, for every pound of cotton, there's about 1.4 pounds of cotton seed produced. And this is very important for our dairy industry. And then there's also this co-product. Uh, I'll call out Dr. Greg Holt has tried to find many different uses. And as we start talking about a circular bioeconomy, uh, this this foreign matter here is all cellulose, cellulosic material uh, that we think does have value. We just haven't found a consistent market for it yet. So again, cotton seed is really important. If you don't think you eat cotton, you do. If you ever had a bag of Utz potato chips, look at the ingredients. It's potatoes and cottonseed oil. Uh, and then again, one of our main customers for cottonseed are dairy cows. It increases milk fat, and it's a premium feed ingredient to the dairy cows. Uh, I, I enjoyed our last presentation on milk. I was listening to see if he used uh, cottonseed in his feed regime, and I don't think he did. So maybe we, I'll have to have a talk with him and see if he wants to get some cottonseed. And then, of course, we have uh, one of the things, cotton has a lot of traceability. And for every bell of cotton, it has a unique identifier. And so that, and then they pull a sample from that bale of cotton when it comes out of the gin press and it goes to the USDA classing office that's run by the Ag Marketing Service. And the growers actually pay $2.35 a sample to have that sample classed for every bale. So all 18 million bales in the U.S. were classed in and in a, there's 10 classing offices around the U.S. And these are called high volume in, instruments and they measure things, micronair, uh, and the short version is it's a measure of fineness, how fine that fiber is, leaf grade and color. Uh, leaf grade tells how much, you know, kind of trash is left in the cotton. The color uh, can, it can turn yellow if it gets wet. Uh, then strength and length and length uniformity are really important uh, mechanical properties in the textile processing. And so the cotton industry has a great history of data use. Since the 1990s, these blue areas have been in place where uh, that data flows to the cotton uh, textile mill, and they use that, and we'll talk later about a laydown, uh, to create their laydown. And uh, that, that quality data also influences, has a big influence on the value of that cotton. So the longer, stronger, cleaner cotton, the more valuable it is. And then more recently, we've been working uh, with the RFID technology to see if we can take that back to the field. And just a quick uh, look at uh, a Micronair map or this uh, yield map here, and then a map, Micronair map here. And you can see the low yielding areas tended to have lower Micronair values. This is some work by Jason Ward at NC State. And then uh, Luke Fuhr and uh, Wes Porter at University of Georgia have done some similar projects. This is where uh, we found modules that were in blue had seed coat fragments, which is something we don't want. And so we're trying to determine if we could take all the data for that field and find out why some areas had seed coat fragments and some areas didn't. So just real quickly, I'm gonna finish off with some textile processing. So this is the, those 500 pound bells go into a, what's called a lay down. And these are actually laid out based on the fiber properties of each of those bells in a special configuration. Uh, Cotton Incorporated has a software called Engineered Fiber Selection that allows textiles mills to do this so that they can be uh, make the most efficient use of their inventory. Once it goes into the uh, lay down, it goes into what's called carding, where the fibers are aligned and paralleled into this web. It makes a sliver. That sliver is then twisted to make a yarn. Here's a, a ring spinning system, and here is what's called a rotor spinning system. And one thing I'll just call, this is more of an older technology where you can see they have to make a, a roving as an intermediate uh, step, and then they have to put it on these bobbins. There's a lot of labor involved, but in rotor spinning, you can see the sliver goes straight into a yarn, and this is actually a robot here. So when something goes wrong, this system goes over and fixes it. And I got kind of a picture. This is just another spinning system, but just to show um, when, so the yarn is broken now, and now this machine's gonna repair itself. And just to show the textile industry has some really sophisticated uh, processes in place. 
and that automation has been there for a long time. That robot in the last picture that was in our uh, our fiber processing lab was there when I got here 20 years ago. So uh, they have been high tech for a while. Then to make a fabric, you can either do it through knitting. Uh, here is a circular knit machine, and this is a flatbed knit machine. This makes a tube of fabric. And so if you want a t-shirt, you can just cut that tube and put some sleeves on it, or you can slice the tube in half and, uh, and use it as a normal pattern. This machine can actually knit a sweater, which I think is fascinating. It, um, a complete sweater can come off that machine. You just cut the, the yarn loose and you can put it on. And then finally, just to show weaving is another process. This is a, a pilot loom, uh, not a full size one. But this is the weaving process where you can see the shuttle comes across, grabs a yarn, and then it, it continues to go on. So that's a, um, most of our t-shirts are going to be knits and where our, you know, uh, khaki pants and jeans are going to be woven. And then finally, some dyeing and finishing. To either we can dye the, the yarn or dye the fabric. And then finally, we get to our shirt. Uh, so we finally made it from dirt to shirt. I know I kind of had to rush the textile part. Um, and then at Cotton Incorporated, we do have this, again, consumer advertising that promotes uh, cotton to through uh, everything from commercials uh, to working with influencers. And lastly, we do have cotton industry sustainability goals. I just want to throw out here uh, about increasing soil carbon, decreasing energy use, reducing soil loss reducing greenhouse gas emissions and increasing water use efficiency. So these are all things that we need engineering help with. Uh, we work a lot with Field to Market. ASABE is a member of Field to Market. Just wanted to, th those kind of, they're like our uh, primary sustainability organization, a lot of, not just for cotton, but for corn and soybeans and wheat. And if you're not familiar with them, I just wanted to call that to your attention. So, uh, Along the lines of sustainability, circularity is something as a cotton industry we're very interested in. Our customers uh, are very interested in. So, um, like I said, we have brands and retailers on our cotton board, and they have said to, figuring out how to make cotton more circular is a high priority. So, I was very excited to see SAB uh, embrace the circular bioeconomy and just call out that meeting on July 9th for our next aim. So with that, I went a little longer than I planned, but I'd be glad to uh, take any questions. Great. Thanks so much, Ed. I'll go ahead and read through a few of the questions that we've received in the chat. And I'm going to skip around because it looks like a few have been answered um, by other people in the chat. Um, so here's one. Um, I fed cotton seed to cows before. Any chance future tech will remove more fibers from that product? I remember the fine fibers in the feed were an inhalation hazard. I, you know, that's a new one to me um, about the, any insulation hazard from cottonseed that I was not aware that was an issue for some people. So I, I can't answer that one. I'm sorry. Uh, the next, you mentioned the reduction in gins due to the changes in harvesting process. What are the different uh quantities of the different gins and can gins take multiple bale types or are they specific to bale type like compactor bale versus module versus round bale yeah so yeah that's a good question the uh that was one of the constraints when when john deere introduced that system that it had to fit within the traditional modules that's why uh the dimensions of that cylindrical module are compatible with the rectangular you know the more the other modules so um the gins were not excited at first. Uh, it did require some different ways to handle that cotton, but most have a have adopt, a, you know, adapted uh, to figuring out how to get that plastic off and and then just process it like they always had. And I will say I didn't bring up. Uh, there's several uh, people working on. Sometimes that plastic gets into the gin, and that is a real problem. And so. Uh, as some of our current research is how can we keep the plastic out and when it does get in there, how do we get it out? Um, here's a question on the human side of cotton harvesting. Um, you mentioned that India's cotton is still hand harvested. 
Does India have similar worker protections uh, and career requirements? I'm sorry, care requirements, water, bathroom, shade breaks um, compared to what we have in the United States? I would say no. And at the same time, I I had a chance to go to India and visit some cotton farmers there. And the first stop was a planned stop and they knew we were coming. And it's predominantly, and this is 10 years ago, I think it's still true today, predominantly women are in the field doing the hand harvest. And I was surprised at how happy they looked and how well dressed they were. And, um, and I thought, well, this is all because they knew we were coming. But then we were traveling around and went to some other farms where they weren't expecting us. And so, you know, they may not have the same worker protections, but I got to say in India, I felt like the, there were, maybe it's the society as a whole, those workers seem cared for and happy. Now, that was my impression. Um, and one more question just came in. Um, what is the link between uh, Coca-Cola and the cotton industry? Well, probably if you saw Coca-Cola that was on uh, Field to Market. So Coca-Cola is a member of Field to Market, uh, as is, uh, I believe, um, Walmart and some of the other food brands. So they're they're more there for, uh, you know, corn and uh, especially for their and corn and beef and wheat and all that. Um, and that's all of the comments, questions I've received in chat. Um, does anyone want to unmute themselves and ask a question over their mic? No, I just wanted to thank you for the great overview. I was packing a lot in uh, in an hour. Y'all are very patient to stick with me for that hour. I have a question. Sure. Uh, you said cotton is two to three dollars uh, when it's a, in the bale form, but what what do the farmers get when they take a module or a the round bales to the gin? What is yeah, the so per pound? Let me clarify. Yeah, the the prices I were talking was priced to the farmer. Uh, that two to three dollars was specific to Pima cotton right now or the, the Cassipian Barbadense that's mainly grown in California. And, and that price is so high because there's a world shortage of that long staple fiber length. Um, the price to the farmer right now uh, for the upland cotton is more on the order of around 85 cents. And it's been fluctuating between, you know, 80 cents and a and dollar 20 over, it's been a lot of instability in the market as all markets over the last couple of years. So that is the price to the, to the farmer. And that is, um, you know, like all commodities, it's amazing to think how little the ingredients. So in a pair of jeans, uh, you know, there's just over, I think uh, a kilogram. So two pounds, sorry, two pounds of fiber. Anyway, less than $2 of raw material in that gene that you know may sell for $25 at Walmart or may sell for $200 uh, at some exclusive brand. That's so definitely the farmer does not always capture all the value of that product. So again the uh, the price is about 80 85 cents or so for the farmer for the finished bale. So they actually go through the gin and weigh his cotton and then he gets paid. Right. Okay, is that how it works? So what's coming in is much more, right? I mean, the seeds and everything in the chaff or the chaff. The, right. The garbage. No, that's a good point. And cottonseed yeah. prices are sold on the ton. So it's the prices have been high, pretty high lately. I want to say $300 a ton for cottonseed. Uh, okay. Still, you know, not as much value as the fiber. Sure. Um, and, but the grower still does get, it depends on the gin, the ra arrangement they have with their gin. But in some gins do give the producer the option to market their cottonseed as well. But what's pro predominantly the case in most of the U.S. is the gin uh, defers their expenses by taking possession of the cottonseed. And when cottonseed prices are high, the gin will then also issue a seed rebate to the farmer for where the value of the seed exceeded the cost of ginning. So really the cottonseed becomes um, 
a, a way to pay for cotton ginning. Thank you. Um, we've got another one in the chat. Um, since Pima cotton is more valuable, um, why don't they grow more Pima cotton in the United States? Oh yeah, that's a very, uh, should have pointed that out. Yeah, so um, in California and Arizona to some extent, extent, New Mexico and around El Paso, Texas, uh, the, the yield penalty, so that is about productivity. And so in general, upland cottons are more productive except in those states I just mentioned. In, in California, Pima and, and Upland almost yield the same. So it's a kind of a no-brainer for the farmer. This price differential is unusual right now. It's usually, but although it's not uncommon for the Pima to be twice as valuable, uh, but if you try to grow Pima cotton, and we have a, a researcher growing some in South Carolina, the yield is at best half of Upland yield. And so, uh, in this current situation, you know, that might be worth sacrificing. And, but I say that's the best case too. And I can't tell you the physiological reason. All I can tell you is there are some environments Pima does not grow very well in, and uh, it does not like humid areas. See someone uh, has their hand up. Yeah, I do. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, um, my name is Phuc Vu. I, I work a little bit in West Africa, uh, in like Mali and that with the issues of deforestation. And uh, the country over there is converting a lot of their uh, cocoa production into uh, cotton. Have you heard anything about that? Are you familiar with the issues there in the Sahel region? I am not other than to know that, you know, West Africa is a cotton growing area and that uh, a lot of subsistence farming is lots of subsistence farmers use cotton as their way to have cat to, to get cash. But I don't know any, I had not heard about the conversion from cocoa. So that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a big issue as far as, you know, the cocoa crop has been predominantly a woman kind of uh, way to to uh, get income. And then a lot of the conversion is uh, sort of taking that away. And then plus of the uh, Sahel region being, uh, you know, getting the, uh, the desert effect. So, yeah, I'm curious if, if you ever come across any issue or uh, the, the problem over there with cotton. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Welcome. Just got another question. Oh, go ahead. Hello, Fred. Uh, this is Tamil. Uh, I before moving to United States, I used to uh, work in cotton farm. We we had our own cotton farm. I'm from uh, southern India. It's uh, typically they call uh, Manchester of India. More cotton produced over there. But uh, one issue uh, when they do manually pick the cotton those days. The bowls open opens up, not everything on one day. It's like it comes like subsequent days. So how they make sure everything opens up at the same time before harvest? Is there any spray used? How how it's done here? Yeah, no, that's a good question. That's why I was saying uh, we do for mechanical harvest in the U.S. and most of the mechan in, in Australia, Brazil. They do wait until the end of the season when most of the bowls have matured when across the whole plant. And that's one of the challenging management decisions a farmer has to make. If he looks and sees there's a lot of green bowls at the top of his plant, does he delay harvest, uh, you know, to wait for those bowls to mature? Uh, that, that's always, you know, there's risk in leaving the cotton out there. So, uh, and there is, uh, there is herbicides applied and a growth hormone, uh, Epithon, to try to encourage everything open at the same time. So they do wait until everything is as mature as possible and then uh, remove the leaves so that doesn't contaminate the, the cotton when it's harvested. Thank you. Um, another question, are you familiar with engineers working um, in other fibers like wool in the United States? That I am not, and I, I know in Australia, um, there's some collaboration between cotton and wool, but in the U.S., I'm not 
aware of that. And I'll say I'm very cock and focused. So, but I will say that the circularity and sustainability uh, has really called to attention the problem of synthetic fibers and that they don't biodegrade. And if you've heard, some of you have probably heard about these microfiber issues where they're finding tiny pieces of plastic, even in salt and beer and water. And so there's a lot of concern being raised. And so a lot of the brands and retailers are interested in how can they still say meet the athletic market uh, requirements with a, with a natural material. And what we're finding is a cotton wool blend can be a good uh, replacement for some polyester applications. Ed, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. And, and as a hand knitter person and spinner weaver, um, I'm definitely a fan of uh, natural fibers and especially local fibers. And I know that there's quite a bit of wool production and other animal fiber production within the United States. And I know that American sheep industry is definitely working on some of these things, but uh, we just, I just got contacted by a student at a local university recently about um, engineering work in wool domestically. And that's why I asked that question. Um, may I put that person in contact with you as well? Oh, please do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And that's but the other thing, like wool is not our, our we, we, we operate in very different markets, so we don't see wool as a competitor at all. Well, that looks to be all the questions we've received. Um, unless there's any anyone else who'd like to jump in here at the end, I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, Ed, this is Ganesh Bora from Fayetteville. Yeah, we're in the same state right now. Uh, when I was in Mississippi State, uh, we had a chance to work with a uh, group from Uzbekistan. And mm -hmm. as you know, like they're more interested in cotton and working with U.S. And one of the scientists from ARS, uh, Mississippi State, he was working with them. And it was kind of, he was leading towards uh, definitely mechanical harvesting and also helping them and unfortunately the scientists died uh, last year and mm -hmm. kind of it got stoned. Anyway, uh, Cotton Incorporated would be working with them and like maybe going for a big deal with USAID projects because most of the crops like soybean and fish and all those things are uh, being developed as a USAID project. Would the Cotton Incorporated would be taking a lead in that direction? Probably not taking a lead, but we have been in contact with some people around, uh, you know, increasing mechanical harvest in Uzbekistan. Most of our agricultural focus is on U.S. producer problems, but I will say that we we are not exclusively promoting U.S. cotton. We're promoting cotton, and so. We kind of have a saying, what's good for cotton is good for cotton. And so Uzbekistan was not good for cotton for a while because rightly or wrongly, there was forced labor issues and child labor issues, of course, being raised there. And so we're very supportive of the efforts that are going on to increase mechanization. Um, and there's going to be, you know, and then on the other side of that, what are you going to do with displaced workers? So there has to be a, a social component to that as well. Um, so I would say indirectly, we have supported some of those efforts. It probably won't be something that will be a, a major focus for us. Thanks, Ed. Okay. Well, I think that is it for today. Um, if you'd all please join me in thanking Ed for a, a very engaging and informative presentation. Um, the next member hour in our series is scheduled for March 1st. Um, and it will be presented by Bob Quinn, the author of Grain by Grain, A Quest to Revive Ancient Wheat and Rural Jobs and Healthy Food. Um, and his focus will be on uh, regenerative agriculture uh, and the future of organics. Um, so please keep an eye out on the ASABE website for details on that presentation. Um, and we'll be sending out an email as well. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, this will be archived again on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to share it or review, 
please do. And thanks again to Ed. Hey, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Really, I've really enjoyed this series, so I'm glad it's going to continue. Thanks, Ed. Goodbye. Right. We'll see y'all.